Father, we love it and give you glory. We, we thank you that that's what you do. What we have sung is what you do. And what we have sung is what we desire. So what you do and what we desire, Lord, we thank you that that's, that's heading in the right direction. To be changed from image to image and glory to glory is a right direction. It's not looking to ourselves. It's looking to you. We're beholding you in your glory. And you change us in the beholding. Oh God, we pray today that even in this time of the word, regardless of how much or how little, that we would behold and see you and be changed, be changed by it. And as we've prayed earlier, we ask, Lord, that anyone who would hear would be changed as well. Father, I look away from myself because I know that this word and this passage requires your quickening. I've, I give and yield myself to you. I ask for the blood to cover and cleanse and for the quickening work of your spirit, Holy Spirit, we are yielded to you, submitted to you, inviting you in and, and, and just embracing your glory, embracing who you are in the work that you desire to do within us. Oh, God, fill us, breathe new life into us, breathe new life into those who are listening, those who might hear in the future, breathe life into them, oh, God. How you love us, Lord Jesus. How you love us, Lord. You love your people. You love the lost and you love the saved. You love us all, God, with an everlasting love. You love us, Lord God. We know that you loved us because when we were wicked, you died for us. Thank you for this incredible mercy. Who can comprehend such love? A greater love has no man that... He lay down his life for his friends. Amen. Thank you, Lord, that you call us friends today. Hallelujah. We bless you and praise you. Lord, please help. Let this work in the direction you've, you've set for us in this place. Let it continue to gain momentum. Let it continue to gain depth. Let it continue to, to be enlarged, as you say in Ephesians 3, to know the width and the depth and the breadth and the height of the love of Christ that passes knowledge. Lord, thank you for your commitment to expand our, our borders, to enlarge our tent, to enlarge us in yourself. That's the beholding. That's the changing from image to image and glory to glory. Enlarge your tent in our, in our being. Enlarge our tent in our being, Lord God. Enlarge those who are listening in their tent, Lord God. Let them be enlarged. Let them see, Father, what you have prepared for them. Eye that has not seen, ear that has not heard, neither has it even entered our heart, the things that you've prepared for us. Hallelujah. Exceeding and abundantly above anything we could ask or think. That's what you said. Not just for us personally, but for your church. And so here we just offer ourselves to you again. In the name of Jesus, have your way. Please, oh God, quicken me, I pray. I need help. I need you, Lord. I need you. Need you. Need you, Lord. We need you. God, we need you. We just thank you. We glorify you. Praise your name. Praise your worthy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Thank you. Romans 5, 20 through 6, 11. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who are dead or who have died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, 
so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I feel like I really just want to make a couple points, and then I might just stop, but we'll see what happens here. In Romans 5, 20 and 21, we find the law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So, This is at the end of chapter 5, talking right in 4, is a a chapter of faith, which moves us into 5, which brings us to uh, this righteousness that has come to us through the work of Jesus, right? His death, through the disobedience of one man, we've all become sinners, we've all died. Through the obedience of one man, Christ, we've all become righteous. So uh, Paul is leading us to this place where he says, he's again trying to highlight this, I, this this issue of law that has, you know, become quite a thing in these days, right? People, all, everybody's, everyone in our area anyways, is talking about the law. But the law fundamentally is simply that. It's the Torah, right? The law came in. And the law came in so that the transgression would increase. The, the, the meaning of that is that our inability to keep the law is exposed, the more we try to keep the law in our in our natural self, in our flesh, we are incapable. We fail. The, we, we are lawbreakers by nature. We need something outside of ourselves, or more accurately, we need someone outside of ourselves. And we need mercy, and we need life that comes to us apart from our goodness. The law exposes our unmeritoriousness, right? Our are, are un, the fact that we do all we deserve is death. That's what he says. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. Verse 21, so that as sin reigned in death, the law reveals your sin because you can't keep it. And, and when you sin, what is the wage? The wage of sin is death. But we know from verse 23 of chapter 6, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul is bringing in this work of grace, this word of grace, this this divine life that is given to the, those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. It's a it's a supply. They, they people, you know this, you know the language, right? We I don't I I don't want to neglect to talk about grace, but I also don't want to get bogged down with it because I know you're familiar with it. But grace we say is the unmerited favor of God, right? That's the definition that is so prominent. Um, I prefer to augment that definition because it's not just about the favor before God. It's what God gives in light of that favor. There's something that flows from God because of grace. So yes, it's unmerited. God looks at me and says, you've put your faith in my son. Therefore, the kingdom is yours, right? The the, the kingdom belongs to you. You have entrance and access to anything you need as it pertains to you now being the child that I've purchased, right? The adopted one. You're the adopted one. My supply to you is as abundant as it is to Christ, seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's It really is astonishing right? The abundance of the supply of God. And that comes through the the work of Jesus. By grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of work so that no man should boast. So I know we know these verses. My definition of grace is this. It's the it's the divine supply of God that is generously, freely, unlimitedly given to perfect righteousness in the believer. And this is what I want to highlight. The reason we're starting in chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, is because grace is, is grace becomes a stumbling block to us, right? The, the fact that by grace are you saved. And so that's why Paul says what he says in 6. He says, should we continue in sin so that grace 
may increase? Should we continue to sin so that the grace of God, the supply, this unmerited favor would abound? Let's just sin all the more. No, grace is given for something very specific that Paul articulates in verse 21. As sin reigned in death, as the law brought you to the end of yourself and killed you, even so now might grace reign through righteousness, which is the purpose of grace. Grace is given to supply your ability to live fully for God, to not live mediocrely for God, to live fully for God. This is our prominent theme for the day. You've been crucified with him. You're dead and you're now alive in Christ. And therefore, the life that Christ has given must be apprehended. Think about what we talked about last week. Come to the end of yourself. Get to the bottom. You get to the bottom. No, people aren't going to the bottom. And so they're swimming in this bogged down place of grace, of mediocrity, because they haven't seen that grace is given to perfect righteousness. Grace now is just this, you know, there's all the language, right? It's a license. Grace is a license. Grace is just this blanket that, that we throw everything under. It's, uh, you know, the grace of God will keep me. And I, I really don't want to get bogged down with that, but I do want, as we're approaching chapter 6 and seeing the, this glorious work of death, I want us to understand that grace... This supply of God, this freely given, unmerited supply, is given to perfect righteousness. It's given to perfect Christ's likeness. Righteousness isn't just um, a, a, a standard to be kept. It's, the, it's how you become like him. Eternal life. You see, righteousness to eternal life. It's the life of God flowing to us to make me like him. And so by the time you get to Romans 8, uh, 29, for example, whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The children of God, we as children of God, from Romans 8, 29 to here, you see there's a thread that connects grace reigning through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, well, Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many brethren, and we are those brethren. And so therefore, we are to take on that image to that degree. And last week, we talked about light. God is light, and in him is no darkness. This is our problem. We dismiss that as the standard. So if you're going to die to sin, die to sin all the way. If you're going to live unto God, live unto God all the way. And if anything that is un outside of living unto God is exposed in you, then kill it. Let the death of Christ deal a death blow to it. Don't treat it as a small thing. Don't nurture it. Don't care for it. Don't, don't uh, dismiss it and treat it as though it doesn't matter. It matters. And so this polarity, this, this, this separation between these two places should be clearly grasped by us and it's what it's what if, if if you can hear what i'm saying i'm trusting i'm all i can do is trust the holy spirit that you're you know that there's a witness in your own heart about this but if you can if you think about it the things we prayed about together today this is the reason it's the reason that we don't die it's that we don't die to ourself we don't that old man we don't care how much he dies we care a little right or we'll care to whatever degree we want to parse it out for ourselves. Hey, this old man, right? He's gone. This old man, I want dead. This old man, I, uh, uh, you and I will work something out, right? We'll work something out so you don't have to die. You can just hang around a little bit in the shadows. And whenever I want to go there, uh, you and I will have some fellowship together. No, the death, right? So when we get to verse nine, uh, 10 and 11, we'll see this. And like I said, I'm just I'm just trying to, to speak by the by the Holy Spirit here today. But we in order for us to start, let us see. Sin reigned in death, grace reigns through righteousness, the very nature and character of God. Not just righteousness as a standard, but righteousness as the person, the person of Jesus. Jesus is righteous. Now you be righteous. Take on his image. 
right? That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff out there. 2 Corinthians 3, he says, the, uh, he basically says the same thing in, in, in a different language. He says the letter kills. The law, the letter kills. It, you, can't, you can't keep it. But it, the letter came with glory. The law came with glory. When Moses got the law, what happened to him? This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says he shone. He came down from the Martin. All he had was the law. Right? He didn't have the finished work. He didn't have the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. He didn't have Christ in him. He didn't have all that we have, but he came down from the mountain because he had been touched by the very glory of God. He saw God, and the glory so affected his being that he glowed. Right, He, he had to put a veil over his face because the people were offended by the glory. Imagine being offended by the glory of God. That's who we are today. Paul says there's not supposed to be a veil over us. We're supposed to behold him with unveiled face. The problem is we want the veil, right? That's what the people of Israel did. They said, no, the glory that you've got, we don't want that. We want you to cover that up. You're going to be the one who goes to God, and we're just going to hang back in the shadows. And so what, did, what happened to Israel? They remained stubborn, stiff-necked, rebellious. They were always murmuring, always complaining. They couldn't enter into the promise after they made it into the promised land for a very short period of time, right? Um, they, they, there, was, there was a season of, of peace and apprehending, but very quickly, particularly after they ask for a king and, and Saul comes and then David comes and then Solomon comes, and as soon as Solomon sins and gives his heart to those idols of his wives, what happens? What happens? Wickedness, lawlessness, idolatry rises within God's people. It's wretched. And so the church is going through the same thing. We're there. I don't know why people don't see it. I don't know why people don't talk about it. The church is going through the same idolatrous process. Maybe... People don't agree with that, but that's what I see. The church is filled, especially the American church. Let's just, let's do, we'll keep it to that. The American church is filled with idolatry. Grace does not reign through righteousness. Grace is a license for my flesh, for my ministry, for my prominence, for my content, for my videos. Grace is a license for my marketing, for my Bible, right? For my book. Grace is a license for that. That's what grace is for. Grace is for me to rise to prominence. That's what the grace of God is for in America. It's for money. And you cannot serve God in, mo in money, right? It's just not going to work. So the Lord is coming. And he's coming with messages that say, let me remind you, let me bring you back to my son. Behold my son, what he's done. And so that's what we're doing today. We're looking at this. We're looking at Christ, just wanting to see him as plainly as possible. Last week, we talked about the light, the, the, the mandate to be in the light. The week before that, we talked about the need for the desperate need for accountability in the way of holiness. At the end of the way of holiness message, we, we said we need to hold one another to the fire to this, right? We need to stand in this place, this place of holiness, this way. We've got to remain in here. We've got to abide in the path. Jesus says, narrow is the way that leads to life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. No, we will not walk in that broad way. This is the same thing with different language. So in Romans 6, verse 1, it says, what shall we say? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May increase? Is there some bizarre, twisted way that God desires me to, to remain the same so that his grace would come to me? Paul says, God, right, King James language is far better than, than other translations. God forbid. God forbid. Shall we stay in sin, continue in sin, that grace may increase? May it never be, NASB. May it never be. God forbid. How shall we who died to sin still live in it. Now, verse 2, let me read it to you again. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? The ultimate, final, the finality of the human experience 
on the earth, not, not in the spirit, but the, the finality of the human experience on the earth is death. Death is the end of your story here, right? This is one of the Romans 6, Romans 7, and Romans 8. are. I don't know whether they're misunderstood or they're just simply neglected, but they are the most needed chapters of the Bible in the American church right now. In, in, in my life, in your life, I don't care who you are, you need Romans 6, 7, and 8. And it begins with this understanding. How shall we who died to sin, to sin still live in it? Just look at the headlines, the Christian headlines. Wait a minute, you were supposed to be dead to sin, but you're still living in it. Oh, well, I did that by grace. That's not what the Bible says, right? Oh, you, you were supposed to be dead to that. That wasn't have, supposed to have any place in your heart, any place in your thinking. You were supposed to be confronting that through the cross. You were supposed to be allowing the cross to kill you to kill everything of that old man, everything that was from your old. That was, the cross was supposed to put that to death once and for all. And that was to be your mindset. You were to embrace a mindset that says, I no longer live. Christ lives in me. But somehow you found yourself in a place where you said, no, it's okay. I, don't, I can continue to live in this by the grace of God. Right? Some of the crazy language we've heard. Uh, you know, I, I just committed fornication. I say a prayer and uh, it's all gone. But tomorrow I'll commit fornication again. I'll say a prayer and it'll all be gone. And, and the Lord will be pleased with me. And the Lord will give me prominence. And the Lord will raise me up. And I'll do this for the Lord. And I'll do that for the Lord. And everyone will, right? I mean, you know... I, <laughs> May, may the Lord give you understanding if you're paying attention to what's going on in the church. And the Lord says, no, you thought, Psalm 50, you thought that I was just like you. But I am going to set the case in front of you now, right? Could the, uh, have, you know, the Lord have mercy on us. You thought that I was just like you to the wicked, the Lord says. What right do you have to take my law within your mouth? What right do you have to, to, to declare my promises and yet be defiled and filthy? How dare you? You think that you can continue this way? The Lord says, no, I'm going to set my case in front of you and everyone's going to see it. And you'll either humble yourself and there'll be a sacrifice or you'll be destroyed. And I'm talking to me, I'm talking to all of us. This is the hour for this to be worked out. So Paul says, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And so this is where the whole thing, if we're, you know, I'm speaking these strong, bold words, right? But if we only understood the glorious gift of death, I said it to a group of men just this past week, we were talking. I said, don't you understand how powerful the cross is? The death of the cross. It's powerful enough. And, you know, just in our own, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try to explain this in the message, but Caroline and I both just over the past, you know, recent weeks, just having these experiences where the Lord's like, this is, must die. This has got to die. It doesn't matter what it is because the Lord has the right to call me into his light and say, my judgment touches you here. I don't care about anybody else. I don't care if they get away with it. I don't care if they get away with it. This is you, you and me. We're reckoning, right? You're going to stand before me just like, uh, you know, remember uh, Peter and John at the, the end of John, uh, the, the, the gospel of John, Peter looks at John and he says, what about this man? Uh, you know, uh, Peter and Jesus are having this conversation and, and uh, Jesus says, you know, some, uh, um, you know, you're going to be taken. You're going to, you're going to be crucified, basically, is what Christ is telling him. He says, you're going to be led by hands that you didn't want to lead you, and they're going to lead you somewhere. And then Peter looks around. He says, well, what about John? What's going to happen with him? And Jesus says, don't you worry about him. That has nothing to do with you. This is me, right? This is my, me in relationship with you. And so this is how we must live. 
We don't have the right to say, hey, look, everybody else is screwing up, so I'll just screw up a little less. So the grace of God will cover it. The Lord says, no, bride without spot or wrinkle. And you're the bride, and I'm dealing with you. But if we understood the glory of the cross, the power of this, that death has power, I would approach my sin in a far different way. I would approach my sin with a boldness that is death. So what is death? Well, when, when you're dead, you know, as it, you know, I'm, think of Pastor Ernie's message. Poor Pastor Ernie kept trying to beat this into us year after year. What is death? Can you tempt a dead man? Can you bring any drug to a dead man? Any lust to a dead man? Can you exalt or, or can, uh, 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 you know, can you magnify a, de- a, a, a dead man? Can, can he be prideful? Can he manifest anything of wickedness? Can he, can he be tempted or seduced by Satan? Can Satan touch a dead man? Can the flesh overtake a dead man? Can the world draw through its lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life? Can it seduce a dead man? No, it cannot. That's the point of Romans 6. You're dead. So consider it so. Live as though this were the case. How shall we who who have died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know? You see, Paul understands. Or do you not know? That all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. You see, this is the missing piece for the church. Or do you not know? The truth is, this is not being preached. And so people can genuinely say, you know what, man, I didn't know that. God have mercy on the pastors. God have mercy on the preachers that are not preaching this word. That are not preaching this cross. That are not preaching this invitation. And that are not manifesting and living out this invitation. So that people can see and say, oh, I see the power of that. Wow, I want that. Instead, it's all this muddy, filthy pool of of mediocrity and compromise. And so here we all stay in the grace of God. It's not right. And so when Paul says, do you not know? We can also say to the church, did you not know? Don't you know? You've been baptized into his death. You're dead. You no longer live. But many can honestly say, wow, I didn't know that. That's poor discipleship. How could you not know that? You weren't discipled right. You didn't know you were crucified with Christ. You didn't know that you have the right to govern over that old man, that he's absolutely powerless in your life. He should have no uh, uh, governance in your life. We'll see it here in the language coming up. You didn't know that you can rule over him in in, in newness of life. I didn't know that. Well, no wonder you keep going back to your sin. No wonder you keep living because you're trying to live by law. You're still trying to please God in the flesh. And you can't do it. You can't please God in the flesh. The flesh can't keep the law, Paul says. Right? The carnal mind is enmity with God. The flesh cannot keep the law. It can't be subject to the law. It never could be. So why are you expecting, why are you surprised by your failure? And no wonder that that other people are now coming because they failed and offering you grace that doesn't lead to righteousness. It's grace that leads to mediocrity. No wonder. Who wouldn't want that? Oh, this works out pretty good. So now I get to have my sin whenever, you know, whenever things get really hard and the Lord understands. And so by grace am I saved. And so the, the confrontation, I don't have to get too caught up in that confrontation stuff. My, you know, my, my dying to sin, I don't have to get too serious, right? Okay. But the Lord's going to bring it, right? You're going to stand before him. You're going to answer. Returning to this, right? When you, when you look at Romans 6 and 7 and 8 and what they really say, what, what you're discussing, the, the reality of a life that's available to us to perfect righteousness, that's grace, right? The divine supply of God given to, given freely, generously to perfect righteousness in the children of God. That's my definition of grace. I was going to say, these, these three chapters have been distorted to misrepresent the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Romans 7. Right? What is the language of Romans 7 that is misrepresented? It's really simple. As soon as you hear it, you'll, you'll, you'll know it, right? For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am flesh, sold into bondage to sin. 
What I'm doing, I do not understand. For I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. <clears throat> the willing is present, but the doing is not. For the good I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. This is the language that is distorted to permit and is even ascribed, you know, to the Apostle Paul. People say, well, look, see, Paul was living a life just like me. Right. No, sorry, you've completely misunderstood what that passage is telling you. Completely misunderstood what Paul is saying. Paul was not like you. Paul is not falling headlong into adultery and fornication and substance abuse and, and uh, you know, idolatry of every kind. No, that is not what Paul is doing. You, that's why you have to start where we're starting. The reason we're starting here, and I don't know where the Lord's going to take us from today per se, but I've already mentioned in previous messages that I know that this is what the Lord wants to begin to bring out. So today we're touching the glory of death. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Wow. If you only knew what that meant. If you only knew that you were dead, your life would change forever. Because you'd have the authority to begin to govern, under, to be governed by the Holy Spirit. You would be a spirit-led person. You would be under the government of God. The glory and the power, grace would be supplied to you. Every time you were tempted, every time you were drawn away, every time you were enticed, you would be engaging immediately with the Holy Spirit, repenting and embracing the love of God. It would fill you. It would drive out. Every other affection would be driven out by the glory that is in newness of life, resurrection life, right? But instead, we focus on the death, we, or we focus on, you know, this thing's, I don't know, you know, how do I overcome? I've told so many people this prayer of, oh God, take this away from me, take it away from me, I'm being tempted, take it away. The Lord showed me so many years ago, that's garbage. You don't want that taken away, you want that, right? You don't want it taken away. No, what you need to do is apprehend what I've done. I've killed that guy. I've killed that old man. Why are you, why are you talking to him? Why are you, why are you asking me to touch something that's already been finished? The language of the verses we've read are our are final verses. They're not future verses. They're what has been done right now. You're dead. So live dead, live alive. If you, if you see the, the starkness between those two things, you live well. If they become muddled in your approach to living, then, then you stumble. You live in mediocrity. You live in powerlessness. There has not been enough victorious living. It's not what people are striving for. Spiritual, you always talk about our inheritance. You know, the abundant life that Christ, that we are, we've inherited that we don't live in, I don't think people believe in that, and I don't think people um, see it. You know, I don't think they they see, they think that, well, I came into, you know, Christianity, I didn't really have too many problems, so it's, you know, or they, they came in, you know, they don't really, you know, she grew up in a Christian family, da 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 yeah. Oh, he has a, you know, this problem, so it's going to be different for him. It's, but it's not true. It's just not true. The, those things are just not true. We all have been given the same thing. We all can be equally victorious and yes. free. He's no respecter of persons. It doesn't. It, but we glory in our uh, weakness instead of in his strength. Right. We, you know, oh, I'm really struggling this week. And, you know, I mean, that's the a attitude instead of... Well, or, and the flip side of that, Caroline, is the person who says just what you said. They say, uh, if, if they're brutal, if, they if they were really searched by the Holy Spirit, what they would have to confess is, I can live for God without God. I don't need the Holy Spirit. Cause, well, it's just rules. Because I was, right, I was raised in a, in, a, in a good Christian home. I, I know how to... I know how to do this, right? 
I don't need the, I really don't need the Holy Spirit. I mean, I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit, but I don't really need him to live for God. Well, that's because you haven't seen that God is light and in him is no darkness. You have no idea. You, right? You, in your place, the cross is still for you. And until that breaks you, that's what David Wilkerson used to say, right? Until you come to ruin over that cross, the reality of your inability to keep the law, until that kills you, Keep the law to what degree? Not to the not to your neighbor's degree. Don't measure yourself against one another. Measure yourself against God is light and in him is no darkness and get on your face. Right? That's our problem. That's why there's no unity. That's why there are such disparity. That's why there's racism. That's why there's, you know, all of this arrogance and, and it's disgusting. And we're just living in the sea of it. God will not have it. God does not want this. He says... Uh, verse, uh, this is verse three. Do you not know? So here's just some, some real wonderful fundamental truth. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Now there's a lot to that. I, I have to confess that I, things are coming to my mind that I haven't even considered before as I'm hearing it, as I'm speaking it. But, you know, Christ went to John the Baptist and he said, suffer it to be so, right? He would, John says, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus says, no, you need to suffer this to be so, to fulfill all righteousness. Baptized into Christ, baptized into his death. The wisdom of God to accomplish so perfectly something that we could partake of by faith and faith alone. So here we have baptized into his death. Baptized into his death. Therefore, verse 4, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Into death. We, we buried. We buried. We were buried. Where were we buried? What were we buried into? We were buried into death. Well, what does that have to do with anything? It has everything to do with it. Because if you didn't die, then you're not raised. If you weren't crucified with Christ, if you don't participate in this, then you're left to yourself. And all you're left with is your flesh to try to please God, like you said, rule keeping. That's all you're left with. That's what the church gives us. The church gives us a bunch of rules. Pastors, books, leaders, teachers, they just give us instructions for living. And I mean, they, they make a joke about the Bible. It's, just, it's your instruction book for living. There, there's a supernatural aspect that's completely lost. In this, and, and what we're talking and, about right yes, now. Yes, and that's why I think people long, they long for supernatural encounters with God, and so they seek out things that feel, that, that, that touch the flesh. That's right. Instead of recognize, instead of, they don't know. They just don't know that there is a spiritual encounter that they can have with the Father, they can have with the Son. They can have with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That, but but the focus has been lost in the church. We've lost focus for why we're even here, and you know why why we're saved, why Christ came. I I really feel that there's just a like there there's 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 a a it's just this is what we do. This is what we do, and and we're supposed to do it, and we're going to do it really well, or we'll do it better than this person, and we'll do it as best as we can. But it's it's we're, we're missing that victorious life that comes from that, you know, where's the darkness in me? Right. That question. That's right. And that there's darkness every day. That's there's right. darkness that wants to creep in. Yep. And I have to separate myself from that through this righteousness that's flowing in right and i feel like the lord has to give us a chance to understand this before he comes let me echo what you said you said people are longing for a supernatural experience with god but what we don't understand is the supernatural work is what we're reading you were crucified with christ that's supernatural but you want something sensory, emotional, right? Something of your senses. You want some. You want your flesh to be tickled in some way to verify 
that this is a supernatural thing that God has done. God said, never said that. God said, this is something you reckon by faith. You account it so. It is supernatural, and I'll work in a supernatural way in you, but you have to do the reckoning. You are going to meet me in faith. And it's actually, it's the, 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 if anything, the experience you're going to get is one of suffering and tears and sorrow, because you're going to realize, my God, I need to die so desperately. This thing really has a grip on my heart. And so the Lord's going to say, well, then let me show you the glory. Let me show you. You're dead. And in a moment, the power of that thing that, that you were so terrified by, it loses its grip because you realize, I'm crucified with Christ. Wow. Supernaturally crucified. I'm, I no longer live. This life that I'm living, it's by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Until you've tasted that, You'll keep living by the rules. You'll keep living out of your flesh. So it is supernatural, but it's not necessarily. That's why everyone goes to the altar. Oh, oh you know, oh, I'm waiting for that. I remember when the Lord touched me and it was so powerful. Yeah, that was great. Thank God for that, right? Use it as a witness. Understand that God loves you and that he cares enough to, to wake you up and, and give you spiritual sight. But the doing of this, the day-to-day -day of it, that's just how it is, brother. Right? That's just how it is, sister. I'm sorry. You're just going to have to die. You're going to have to live by faith and understand that God did the supernatural work. He didn't promise you some divine touch every time you die to yourself. He didn't promise you some, Woo, I, now I know I'm dead. Praise the Lord. I saw fire come down from heaven. No. It's just faith. Just start living this thing out. There's nothing like that promised in the scripture. The supernatural work has been done. This is what this is Christ risen from the dead. Amen. He died for you. He was buried. He rose again. That's the gospel. That's the supernatural work that God has given. That's why the gifts of the Spirit are fundamentally for the building up of the body and for ministry out into the lost world. Right? Right. That's where the woo is. That's where the woo That's is. where the woo is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's in it's in knowing that you can be Christ to a lost and dying world. That's right. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. about me being good and being good enough and following the rules and pleasing my pastor. And well, even why I come to church is to get that filled up thing and, and then I leave. And someone isolated, Ed Cole, say this. He's saying, when you come into the house of God and you're filled up and you're built up and you're edified and you're strengthened and then you go out into the world and you just live for yourself, he said, that's immoral. Hmm. That's immoral. To have God's life and do nothing with it outside the church is immoral. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Well, we all have our own accountability. We all have to plug into this. It's not like we're like like we're we're pointing the finger to the, yeah. you know, out there and saying, Hey, oh, you get your act together. This is me. Yes. I need this. I need to die. I'm accountable for what the Holy Spirit shows me and says, look at this is causing this is causing your own weakness. You wonder why you're uh, you know why you're why you're struggling to enter into uh, 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 this right this fuller place. You wonder, you know, I'm not going to try to speak the things the Lord's dealing with me about, but don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. It simply comes down to this. You've made it about you not about me. You're not reckoning yourself did, dead and living in the simplicity of, of living in the risen, uh, in, in my, you know, in the risen son of God. It's not complicated. And we all have to deal with that. All right. There are things there, each, all three of us, I'm, I'm just speaking to us right now. We're at, we're angry and we're frustrated and we're asking God why this. And the Lord says, this is still the answer. It's still the cross. It's enough. Die. Die. And see the victory. Snub your nose at the devil. And tell him, Forget you. I'm done with you. Ruling over my life with this wickedness, with this, right, with, with whatever it is, this weight, this burden, this, this, you know, call it whatever you want to call it. Fill in the blank for yourself. No, I'm dead. That old Doug, that old Caroline, that old Millie, guess what? They're all dead. Mm -hmm. And there's, and, and so Satan it, when when your old man can be seduced out to, 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 to act out, 
you know the cross isn't, you're not resting in the cross. Because what this says is, knowing this, our old man was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be a slave to sin. We would no longer be a slave to the old man being enticed by this, being enticed by that, being stirred up by this, being stirred up by that. We would no longer. We're not subject to that. We're dead. It has no power. And so I'm either going to stand in the authority of death or I'm going to make place for my old man. And that's what we do. We make place for our old man. This is why I say, there's. if we were going to walk through this text, we would. We could just go verse by verse and talk and, and, and look and just behold at the glory of what is here. Verse 7 tells us, the one who has died is freed from sin. Are you, what? Yeah. The one who's dead is free? Amen. Yeah. So how come I'm not free? Because you're not dead. I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's that. Don't, don't complicate it. Yeah. Don't try to come up with some, you know, oh, it must be. This is why, you know, the world is seductive, man. You, you've had this issue and this issue and this trauma and that trauma and psychology and this diagnosis and all of these things. That's, that's too big for God. That's too, the, the cross isn't powerful enough to deal with all that. Right. Um, that's not what the Lord says. That's right. Because people were traumatized and abused and right. suffered in this right. era, right. just as they are today. It's always been the same. Right. Read the book of Judges and see just how wicked people are, right? Here, you can have my daughter. You can have my, you can have, uh, my, uh, my servant. You can rape her all night. You can, and then I'll cut her into pieces and I'll send her to the 12 tribes of Israel to show how wicked Benjamin is. This is the madness, right? That's the book of Judges. This is how disgusting and dark humanity's always been. Yeah. So we, how dare we tell God that the cross is not enough for us today? But we do. We love it. And because, why? Because it allows us to, to nurture our flesh. Nurture your flesh. Let me just get out this. <laughs> I'll get this out and then we'll close and pray. Because like I said, we just keep talking. Verse 10 and 11, the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. You see, that should be my life. I too, because that's what Paul says, therefore you now Consider yourselves dead to sin. He died to sin once. Who died to sin once? The one who had no sin and became sin for you. He died to sin once. And now he lives fully unto God. So you also now, you enter into that life because he did that for you. You see, the cross was for this. The purpose of the cross was so that you could no longer live to sin. So you could truly declare, declare yourself free because you've died. You're dead. Therefore, you're free. And so you, because what Christ has done, you now can also live as a free person. How do you do it? You do it by faith. You receive it by faith. You stand, you know, Julius, brother Julius, he's, he loves, you know, he, he, uh, the guy took, a, you know, a year to, to just meditate and let ruminate in Romans 6. And he says, uh, you know, the language he uses, he says, when, when, when my flesh or the devil comes and tries to, you know, to tempt me, he says, that man is dead. <laughs> that man is dead. You got nothing. Man, that is so powerful, right? That man is dead. That man is dead. You got nothing. Uh, and so he's been just this past week, that example that I gave, how do you, you know, what do you, what do you entice a dead man with? You know, you, you can't, you can't seduce a dead man. You can't tempt him. It doesn't matter what goes on around him. Amen. Now, that's the supernatural work that we're believing God for because it does go into places that are not obvious, right? The pornographer, Doug Reagan, the pornographer, well, yeah, he's, he doesn't look at pornography, but all of the deeper things, the issues of heart still need to be put to death. The sexualizing, the objectification, all of those, those that, that <clears throat> wickedness that just is a part of that life and that lifestyle 
that still has to die. So when you see it, do you just throw up your hands and say, you know, well, I, you know, at least I'm not doing that. Or do you take the same cross that gave you that victory and apply it to this and apply it to this and apply it to this? It's the same cross. You see, that's the glory of the gospel. It's one gospel that fits every need that can ever be experienced in the human condition. Homosexual, transgender, pornography, sin, pride, money, criminal behavior, right? Stealing, uh, you know, larceny. Doesn't, it just doesn't matter. It's one gospel that fits the human condition. You're dead, you're buried, you're risen with him. How do you know? Because the Bible tells me so. Because Romans 6, 7, and 8 tell me very plainly that by, right, Romans chapter 8, this is one of the most, uh, you know, you should just treasure this verse here. What does he say relative to what we're talking about here? He says, Romans 8, 12, and 13. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But, but. If by the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. How do you put yourself to death? By faith and the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the interesting things of Romans 6 is the Holy Spirit is mentioned nowhere. There's no Holy Spirit in Romans 6. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is the quickening agent for us to meet us at what Romans 6 has accomplished. Romans 6 is, is simply a declaration of what God has done. Now, it does exhort us to do things, to respond based on what God has done. But fundamentally, Romans 6 is just establishing a fact. The whole point of Romans 6 is Christ did this. And because he did this, this was your participation in that. You didn't even participate in it by your own will. It's what God did. God put you in Christ and crucified you with Christ. You didn't do that. That wasn't an act of will, an act of choice. God, he, he did it all in Adam. First Adam, second Adam. That's it. Everything of the old man is gone. You didn't have anything to do with it. You do have to be in agreement with the Holy Spirit. That's why Romans 8 is about the Holy Spirit. You, by the Holy Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh. That's you walking in agreement with the work of God. Romans 6 is, this is what God did and why you can do what Romans 8 says. You see what I'm saying? Very, so it's, this is discipleship. This is how people need to be uh, taught and, and instructed in how to walk. Oh my goodness me. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it amazing? Oh, Jesus, help us. Father, we just come asking you to meet us, thanking you that you have met us. Let me say it this way. I just thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes today, opening our hearts today. We pray, Father, that just as we have been enlarged and quickened by your spirit, by your word and our conversation and fellowship, our communion, that you also would quicken those, Lord God, who are desperately longing for liberty and freedom. Let them see, let them hear, hear a seed of something that is that will transform them forever, change them forever, because you did what we could not. That's the gospel. You did what we could not do. So we worship you. We give you glory and praise. We return you the glory that is rightfully yours because of all that you've done on our behalf. And we thank you, Father. And so we just bless. If you're, you know, I just, I guess I'll just boldly pray. If you're struggling with anything, seek God. Get in his word. Get in Romans. Yes. Get in Romans 6, 7, 8. Get in. Fellowship with him. Commune in him. Mm -hmm. And Father, we pray for those that they would experience your supernatural work. It is supernatural. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But it doesn't come supernaturally as we expect it to come. And so we thank you, Lord, for uh, your power being released and manifest to all those, Lord, who might partake. And we thank you for being with us in our communion today. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.